this is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 5th of April 2016, a podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anyone working with or investigating big data. My name is Dave and here's my co-host Jon. Hi Dave, how are you today? Hello Jon. So, what's, uh, what's your last two weeks look like? Been up to anything fun? Uh, well, of course, it was the Easter break. That's always fun, eating a lot of chocolate eggs. It did, however, make me do less of a Hadoop, big data kind of thing. So it's been a bit empty, not that much to talk about. The only thing I would mention is we did a big data analytics event in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago. And usually these guys only do the London region. It's the first time they went to Amsterdam. So we went there with uh, well, quite a few people, actually, but we didn't expect that many visitors since it's the first event of a new organizer, let's say. But they were actually jam-packed. They actually had to uh, steer people away because the uh, venue told them they were at capacity. So there's still a big interest in uh, the big data and the Hadoop uh, from new people to the, to the industry. Fantastic. It's always nice when, uh, when events like that are packed. It gives you uh, a feeling that it was worthwhile uh, making the effort to do everything there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you go away from those feeling I was bored out of my, uh, what do you call it, the whole day long, that's uh, not a good feel. But this was really glad this day's over. It's been tough. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What did you do? Uh, yeah, so Easter break as well. Uh, went away and uh, spent some time walking around the mountains of Wales which was very enjoyable. Um, and uh, the only kind of, lots of calls and meetings as, as per usual. The only other thing that really sticks into my mind is had a really good um, workshop over a period of several days with a um, fairly large European telco um, and their sort of primary hardware and services uh, vendor. So kind of these sort of three-way workshops are always kind of interesting because you know, you're used to dealing sort of primarily with uh, yourself and the customer. And then when there's a partner looped in as well, there's actually, you know, three different aspects that you need to consider before even even saying anything. But it went really well. Um, and, you know, this was focused on a bunch of different things. They're, they're looking to uh, create the next revision of their overall um, Hadoop architecture and infrastructure. Um, they're also looking at their uh, their next round of use cases for 2016. Um, and they're they're looking towards you know um, the future of um, security services and how they're going to be applying those um, you know and the new security features that are coming along with uh, with Atlas and Ranger in the future. So very good set of sessions, uh, lots of uh, long days, but uh, yeah, really worthwhile. It does kind of sound like you're specialising in the telco industry these days. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an area that I've we've just spent a lot of time. Um, through the years working with them so I kind of I know the I know the business I know a lot of what they do and I know a lot of the technology that they use behind the scenes as well so yeah there's been a certainly I have a natural affinity to that so it's uh, it's always always nice spending time yeah it's good because uh, domain knowledge is always very important in these kind of big data uh, uh, logic, uh, process flows if you, if you can talk to talk to customer talks that's really helping a lot making things clear getting them on board and accelerating the whole thing yeah, yeah, definitely. I think domain knowledge generally is is more important in um, in the big data world than it is in traditional you know platform technologies because the you know big data is at that that uh, inflection point that junction between uh, IT and business. You know, you 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 don't deploy a big data platform um, just so you can store data. You do it so you can deliver uh, value to the business and to the organization. So preferably so you can actually revolutionize the way that 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 organization operates so it's as a technology i think big data is closer to uh, the business than you know most things that people have been using for the last you know 10 15 years yeah it's a lot less well defined or square edged than uh, yeah the traditional solutions people are using indeed definitely so anything else from you no that's it keep it short this time Indeed. All right. So that's it for this uh, quick intro as to what we've been up to. Um, coming back after the break, though, we've got uh, an interview with Venkatesh Shalapa, who has uh, kindly agreed to talk to us about his upcoming session at the uh, Hadoop Summit uh, 2016 in Dublin. And his session is A Beginning's Guide to Becoming an Apache Contributor. So he's got lots of good things to say, and uh, it was a really nice interview. So look forward to that straight after the break. 
Yeah, don't forget to mention he was a community choice winner for the Hadoop Summit, so it must be a good session, and I definitely know that the interview was all the fun. All right, see you soon. Okay, so we're back and uh, we have our next interview. So here we have uh, Venkatesh uh, from Teradata, who's coming today to talk to us about how he became a contributor to Apache NiFi. Now, this is uh, one of a, a series of uh, sessions that we're doing around the Apache Hadoop Summit uh, in Dublin. And this is around a particular session that Venkatesh is actually going to be delivering. So if, if you find this kind of teaser interesting, then you should absolutely go along and uh, see his session uh, in real life. But uh, Venkatesh, first of all, you know, really, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Um, welcome to the Roaring Elephant podcast. Um, thanks for having me and uh, uh, excited to be here. I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. Um, I like the series that uh, that you guys have had so far. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. Okay, so um, tell us a, a little bit about yourself, um, how you got into to this uh, wonderful world of big data. Um, I've been working with uh, big data before it was called big data. We just used to call it data at that point. <laughs> um, I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the oldies in that aspect. Um, I think I've been working with Hadoop since it was 0.01. And uh, because my background is around uh, more around sort of analytics, we needed something that would allow us to do uh, analytics on the cheap. Yeah. And this was the days when MapReduce was the only thing that you could use and you could interface it with Python and Java and all of that. So that's kind of how I got into it. So I was trying to solve a particular type of problem. Um, Working with large banks, they tend to have um, lots and lots of uh, fast-moving data. Yeah. So that's sort of my background and intro into big data. At that point, it wasn't called big data. It was just here is a thing that you could use for uh, doing large-scale analysis on the cheap. Yeah. And uh, that was it, really. That's, that's kind of how I started. And um, then I got... Uh, uh, pulled into the wonderful world of Teradata. And mm-hmm. I've been with them for about 18 months now. Slightly more, I think, yeah. My boss thinks it's a lot more. But yeah, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, that's great. Um, so without giving uh, absolutely everything away uh, about your session, how would you, how would you summarize your, uh, uh, your session uh, for the audience? Um, I think the this session is, uh, sort of interesting in the sense that it is from the perspective of someone who has been on the inside and also who's been on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks at uh, it looks at a few things at the same time. So it looks at it from a developer's perspective, from a tech lead's perspective, from a business perspective, and also from a um, uh, from a slightly um, what is all of this thing about perspective? So why should I be contributing to an Apache project? What's the advantage from a developer's perspective? Um, what's the advantage if I'm a manager? Should I be um, allowing my developers to work on it? Or should I be encouraging them to do it? And from an organization um, standpoint, does it make sense for an organization to have its people contribute to this? Are they not just sending things away for free? You know, those kind of things. So it's, it's a mix of all of that. It's not going to be entirely about uh, writing code, but I think it's going to be about writing code, but also looking at the larger picture of how you can write code and be in a position where it's valuable for your organization itself. Yeah. I think the the that last piece is is particularly interesting because if you look at a lot of organizations today you know they're they're considering 
contributing to open source more and more than ever before. If you look at the the rise of open source in enterprise organisations, you know, really really started with uh, with Linux, and uh, which is now a, a firmly established core of the majority of uh, data centres. So you know, open source as a as something that they consume is is very sort of very well understood. But that um, that sort of bridge between or bridge from consumption to actually contribution is now, I think, the new hot area. That's the area that people are now uh, focusing more on um, to understand what they can do to contribute, what you know, what makes sense from them from an organisational point of view, and what benefits they get from it. So, yeah, that, that sounds like sounds like a great session. Yeah, uh, I mean, I. And, and you touched on the uh, on the key point, which is around Linux. Now, um, when I started working in 2002, uh, you couldn't go into a bank and say, you know, shall we have Linux? I mean, you, you would be laughed out because, yeah. you know, it doesn't have parallel processing. Who's going to support us? Uh, it doesn't do SMP. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. And the key question, obviously, was, you know, what happens if it all fails? And that was 2002. And by 2012, it was the de facto standard in all data centers across the board. Um, And I think it's very similar to what's happening with the Hadoop world as well. Is um, it starts off as being something which is with exactly the same problems. How are we going to get supported? What does it mean to us? And from an organization perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense to have people who are in the flow of this, who understand how this works, who understand it from a code perspective, from a um, from a leadership perspective, from also the idea of how to engage with the community. So I think there is a there is a bridge that needs to be built, and I'm hoping my session would be something which would provide a bit of all of these, which is how does a developer who's on the outside come into this. How does a manager come into this? And how does the organization itself come into this and leverage um, the open source, not just from a consumption standpoint, but also be in a position to contribute positively towards it? Yeah. Okay, great. So someone uh, someone thinking about um, taking the, their first step on this journey, you know, how, how do they... There are so many different projects out there. Um, how many? How does someone choose which project that uh, uh, they should start considering contributing to? How, how did that decision making process run for you? Um, it's the it's the old scratch your own itch thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I I run I use Linux for my own um, uh, laptop, and I uh, I have contributed to some of the the. Uh, the device drivers and some of the other smaller things in on the Linux side, in the in the open source side, um, uh, in the Hadoop side, I think the key for me personally was the bigger question of how to do data ingest. Mm-hmm. And um, there are lots of projects that are competing in that space, but I think NiFi had that one particular sweet spot, which is. Um, it does a few things correct. It doesn't do all of it correctly, but it does yep. a few things that I think are extremely important. Um, one is it allows you to bring in data from the edge into the system, which I think not very many products do it very well. Yep. Um, the second thing that interested me about NiFi was the GUI. Um, you're in a position to take a UI and show it to an end user and say, that's how it works. So while it's good to say that Kafka can do this or um, you've got some things coming from Confluent that can do this, but Mm -hmm. the ability to show them in a UI, uh, I mean, a picture speaks a thousand words. So I love that aspect of it. And the third aspect, which I really like, which is kind of odd, is it's written in Java. Now, (laughs) The advantage of I know that there was a lot of oh Java that's you know that the balls and that's this and that's that and all of that yes I I, I get it I mean I um, I can write Python and Scala and Clojure and whatever but the biggest advantage of Java is the tooling ecosystem around it which means that there are lots and lots of developers that can leverage that and get up to speed with it quickly which means that if you take this to a 
um, to a customer and say that these are the things that we do with it. And the customer says, yeah, but I like 95% of it. I'm missing the 5% over here. They can quickly get one developer from their side to work with it. And I think that's a very, very powerful thing. Yeah. Um, so, so you've got these three bigger uh, pictures to it. One is I think the ingestion problem is an unsolved problem. The second aspect is um, the fact that it's actually written in Java helps, helps a lot. And uh, the third aspect, obviously, is, is the GUI. So it means that you've got this nice loop that is running where you've got your um, analyst working on it, looking at the UI, saying something doesn't really work. I would like this to be tweaked a little bit. You've got a pool of developers who are in a position to work with it. And uh, they're solving the bigger problem of uh, data ingestion. So that's the reason why I find it extremely, uh, that's my personal th- reason why I got into it. Perfect. So, I mean, do you think that it's important that uh, someone should, you know, should should love, should be passionate about the actual uh, project content itself? Or do you think, you know, just a uh, an enjoyment of programming is enough? If you like it, um, and if you have a passion for it, then it definitely helps. Um, but a love of programming is obviously kind of key. Um, it, it just makes the journey more enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, and the NiFi community itself, from um, from Joe Witt, uh, who's the director for it, um, k- kind of the mentor for the project, um, to everyone else around it, the community itself is extremely welcoming and uh, very encouraging, very welcoming. And um, I just, I just love working with them. Great. So, what do you think makes um, a good contributor to an open source project? And you know, perhaps what are some of the behaviours to to watch out for or to avoid if you're trying to uh, become a, a good contributor to a project? Um, I think becoming a good contributor um, requires a few uh, a few skill sets around it. Um, Obviously, a love of programming helps. Um, being able to—that's you know, that's kind of—that's kind of, um, uh, that's kind of obvious. But um, so that's kind of one. But then, then there are certain social skills that need to be around it as well. Um, the ability to be on a mailing list and actually read through some of the content that uh, can, to start with, look extremely dense. That's important. Um, Documentation, reading documentation, very important. Um, a lot of times, um, contributors I've seen or uh, guys who are coming in new to it jump into it quickly without looking at the history of it. Mm-hmm. And um, that can quickly turn off some of the more uh, senior contributors. I'm not one of them, but I've seen a lot of the senior contributors because they they get you know tons and tons of emails and they are a lot of them are not doing this as their full-time job. They're literally doing this in the in, you know, evenings or weekends or um, something like that. So in that case, um, it really helps if you communicate with them um, after, having, after showing that you've actually read through the documentation. Um, asking questions the right way, I think that's yeah. important. Um, the ability to filter down and nail the problem and if you say that there is a problem, it always helps if you provide the patch. Everybody loves to look at a patch. Everybody does. <laughs> so, 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 the, so, so if you say, I've seen a problem, and I think this is where the problem is, and I think this is how you solve it, I mean, you're already 90% of the way there. Um, and if you're not in a position to write, um, uh, to do development, or you're not in a position to write code, um, just being in a position to actually augment the documentation, that is a huge plus. That's a huge plus. So if you're stumbling into something and you find that this can be improved, uh, the ability to write documentation cleanly and clearly is, is extremely prized. And uh, that, that's, that's a huge plus. So if you can do all of that, I think you're A grade, you're in. Yeah, I mean, actually, the the documentation point is is an incredibly valid one. It's one that people often miss. Um, you know, people think it's all about the code, but that's you know, it's, it's not entirely true. And in fact, 
um, uh, the majority of my contributions towards open source have actually been around the more of the documentation side that I'm definitely not a an A grade programmer uh, in, by any shape, uh, way, shape or form. But uh, contributing towards documentation is, is something that uh, anyone and everyone uh, pretty much should be able to do. So, yeah, very good points. And um, just just to add to it, the ability to actually answer questions on mailing lists when new people are coming in. Um, again, something very simple, very straightforward, um, but you find that uh, the people who are more priced within the community are in fact the people who are doing the documentation, who are uh, responding to uh, um, uh, responding to questions on the mailing list or who are sort of gently shepherding the newbies who are coming in. Um, yeah. I find that they, they get a, there, there is a lot of uh, karma. Yeah, I, I think that's very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, build, building that community, that's, that's what this is all about. Absolutely. All right. So um, you're, you know, obviously, so you're, you're already uh, a contributor now. Is it, is it your intention to sort of progress your involvement? Are you intending to become a, a committer on the NiFi project? I would love to be one. I uh-huh. think the, um, but becoming a committer um, involves uh, a few things. One is it's obviously something that the community chooses. Yeah. And um, I think the reason why, and I have seen some of the other folks who have become committers, um, I think a lot of that is dependent on how much time you can um, devote to it. Now, in many cases, you know, folks from Hortonworks do this as a as a as a full time thing. Um, this is not part of my full time thing. I do it on you know weekends and and holidays and when I'm on planes and hotel rooms and things like that. <laughs> so, um, I would love to be one if I could find um, the right balance between my day job and what I do here. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely makes sense. So, I mean, if, if someone's on the fence, you know, thinking about uh, becoming a contributor to an Apache open source project, what would you, uh, you know, what would you recommend they think about? What, what would you recommend they, they uh, consider um, if, they're, if they're looking at this? And maybe what would you suggest their, their first steps be? Um, if they're thinking about an Apache project, um, I think one of the suggestions I would have is to start off with a project that, is possibly in the early stages of um, being in Apache. Um, So, for example, projects like Spark or Zookeeper or Hive um, or HBase, they're they're fairly mature mature projects. They do tend to have a lot more to learn with. So there is Mm -hmm. the curve to get there is a lot higher. So my suggestion would be to pick up a project that's on the in the earlier stages, probably not beta, but just coming out of beta or just been accepted or just coming out of the incubator, those mm-hmm. projects are much better to start with, easier to start with. Um, the second thing I would definitely suggest is uh, pick up a project that solves the kind of problem you're interested in. Um, so if you're looking at something around machine learning, then you should be looking at specific projects for that. Um, if you're interested in, um, you know, sort of key value pair type uh, stuff, then that's the that's the work that you should be going to, because it, it, it does tend to be. It's not just about passion. It's also about um, linking the things that you do in your day job and being in a position to sort of add value to this. So it, it should be something that goes um, hand in hand. And um, I mean, last but not the least, of course, um, it's important to have. Um, it's important to get your programming up to speed as well. It doesn't doesn't mean that all the problems that come into this, or all the bugs that are there, are uh, extremely hard bugs to solve. Um, in fact, in many cases, quite the reverse is the case. But just being able to understand all of the code uh, does require a bit of time to get used to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, getting your getting your head around the, the the code base is a is a fairly strong requirement if you're going to be dipping in and out of the code for that, and having having some understanding of how things all hang together, fairly key there. Yeah, I think, um, and I got lucky with Nifi. I mean, I've I've contributed to some of the other ones as well, um, but with Nifi, I think we have 
quite a neat, uh, um, quite nice documentation around that. But in some of the other projects, this is not so. And this is not because of lack of will. It really is because of lack of time. Yeah. And in those kind of cases, just just getting to grips with all of the code that is in there, and it tends to be quite large. Um, that takes up a lot of your time, and it also means that you know you tend to get discouraged, which is something I've seen that happen, um, especially on mailing lists. People try, try hard, and then because they're not in a position to contribute because they haven't been able to do that, they get discouraged very easily. I, I would definitely say not to give up. Yeah. Yeah, perseverance is is definitely key when it comes to, especially yeah. at the early stages. You know, there, there are going to be the 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 few kind of uh, road road bumps and stumbling blocks in the way, but uh, hopefully, hopefully the the value is there at the end of it, and people get something out of it uh, from from contributing to open source projects. The the things that people get out of it are. Um, you know, are not not something you get with, uh, a, you know, a normal job necessarily, or even a, uh, a a standard kind of IT project. You're you're contributing to something that is going to be you know consumed by people around the world, and not not very many people can can really say that. So, uh, it's it's pretty exciting stuff, I think. It is, and um, I mean, not to put too fine a point, but you you will find that it's almost. Um, it's almost like a master class because you're working with programmers who are, at least in my case, way above my league. And um, I'm usually just trying to follow their footsteps. And it, it, sometimes you kind of follow their footsteps and reach in the end and find there's a blinding light at the end of it. So it's like be- defeating the big boss in a game or something. <laughs> <laughs> you find it. Wasted. Yeah, I always think that... Uh... Open source projects generally, in, it, it's it's all it's all about standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, you might Absolutely. you might develop a little bit further, but it's only because some amazing people have uh, have blazed the trail before you. Absolutely, oh, excellent. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like you've you've had uh, some contribution across you know a variety of different uh, projects and a, a variety of different open source sort of areas. You know, how would you describe? Um, you know, the, the Apache Software Foundation and, you know, the, the framework that that provides, um, you know, do you think that's particularly valuable to, to the world of Hadoop? Or do you think that actually, you know, everything could be GPL or, it, you know, it doesn't really matter? What, what, what do you think about that? I think the, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the discussion between GPL and non-GPL code, because you mentioned that, is um, that's almost kind of a religious debate. Uh, in some senses, it's the it's the uh, is the licensing world of um, Vi were equivalent of Vi versus Emacs or yeah. uh, you know something along those lines. There is no right or wrong answer, and I don't uh, I don't think I know um, the answer to that. But I can definitely say on the flip side of it, because the Apache Software Foundation is there, it provides you with a few things that you do not get anywhere else. One is there are clean, clear ways of a project coming into the foundation itself. So be it from Hortonworks, be it from Cloud Data, be it from um, Google or anyone else, they can say, mm-hmm. that's something we want to contribute. And there is a clean engagement process with it. And I think that's very, very valuable. That's very valuable. So there's a clean uh, process there. The second thing is, because it's not a viral license, um, organizations that want to leverage this and on the other side, organizations that want to contribute to this can do it with a, uh, can do it without any issues. So, so for example, if there are organizations that have their IP, uh, they can say, you know, we want to ensure that our IP is protected while we are contributing to this. That can be done because the foundation is there to take care of it. And from a developer's standpoint, the advantage is that all the, the software foundation provides you with a framework in terms of um, where the code will be, how to contribute to it, um, you know, and your contribution is open, what is the license that is applied to it, what, what is the way that you engage with the sort of elders in the community, all of these things are cleanly defined. So when a new project comes in, they can look at it and say, okay, this is how 
the previous ones have done it, and these are the steps to take. And that's that's all laid out for you. So you, you're quickly in a position to get, get up to speed with actually contributing code or contributing documentation or being on the mailing list without having to do a lot of the uh, grunt work that is necessary in uh, many cases. And I think that's, that's, that's a big advantage. I think overall, the Apache Software Foundation is the right way to do it, especially within the Hadoop community. Excellent. Okay, so so just to the wind up the uh, wind up the session then, um, for someone that's uh, that's thinking about attending your session, what would you what would you say to them? I think you should, um, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Me too. Um, I think uh, I think it's because this is a session that someone like me wanted to attend when I first started. Um, and something like this didn't didn't exist. So it's it's a it's a session that will walk you through some of the realities, what and all. It's a personal journey. Um, it's probably not going to be something that is uh, that is what's the word I want to say. It's not a very corporate speak around it. It's just an individual saying these are the things that I do, and I and this is the way that I got into this. And this is the value that it has brought to me. It has brought to my organization. It has brought to, um, uh, and I am attempting to bring to the project itself. So I think from an overall perspective, um, it is it should be an interesting session. And it is something that is completely different from the rest of the sessions as well. So, yeah, it should be good fun. Fantastic. So uh, for those that uh, are considering attending, at, at least on the current agenda, and uh, you know these sessions may well uh, adjust a, a little bit uh, before the event kicks off, but uh, uh, currently Venkatesh's session is, is the, one of the first sessions uh, pretty much straight after the uh, keynotes of Wound Up and, and Morning Tea. So 11.30 till 12.10 on the 13th of April, at the 2016 uh, Hadoop Summit in Dublin, Ireland. So, I mean, thanks so much for your time, Venkatesh. I, I hope your session goes very well. I'm certainly going to uh, try and come along and see it as well. So I look forward to seeing you there. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much for your time. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been, a, uh, it's been good fun. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks, Jan. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, session with uh, Venkatesh. Um, we had a, a great time talking to him. Obviously, a very smart guy and a community, a cho a community choice award-winning uh, session there. I'm really looking forward to um, catching up with him and, and hopefully seeing his session at the summit, although he's, he's up against some tough competition in that particular time slot. So uh, we'll see how many, how many sessions we, uh, we get, to, get to get along to. Coming up after the break, uh, rather than our usual questions from the audience, as we went quite long on our previous episode, we're actually just going to uh, cover off our plans for the Hadoop Summit, um, Roaring Elephant style. So stay tuned for that. So welcome back. Um, we thought we'd do something a little bit different for this one as uh, questions for the audience didn't quite feel right um, based on our previous uh, interview. But what did feel right is for us to talk about what we're planning to do, Roaring Elephant style, at the Hadoop Summit coming up. Um, so we are actually going to be both Jon and myself at the Hadoop Summit and we plan to be, when we're not sort of... Uh, uh, as representing as pure Hortonworks employees, we're actually going to be wandering around, uh, visiting sessions, talking to uh, people both presenting and um, you know, interacting in the sessions. And we're going to try and make sure we can get some interviews with uh, various people. So you know, we will be wearing bright yellow uh, tops with the walking, the walking, the roaring elephant uh, logos on the back. Um, so look out for us in those uh, giant yellow uh, tops with the Roaring Elephant logos. Uh, I think we're going to be fairly difficult to miss. I would hope so. We'd really try to make sure we stand out. <laughs> yeah, uh, the only thing we're missing is large yellow elephant hats. Uh, but who knows, maybe. 
Oh, well, let's do it for next year. Hmm. <laughs> Anyway, if you, does, if you do see us uh, walking around there, feel free to approach us, talk to us, ask questions, whatever. We are always happy to interact with our audience. Indeed. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Um, tell us that you want uh, Jon to be uh, broadcasting with far more energy because uh, he likes that. Yes, my uh, gentle co-host Dave always tells me to be more energetic in my talking, but that's just the kind of person I am. I'm mellow. Smooth talking Jon. Uh, one of the things we are trying to uh, accomplish during the summit is to have a daily uh, kind of de- a wrap-up of uh, what we did that day, what we saw that day, what was interesting, what was less interesting perhaps as well, and get that out of the door at the same day, which is going to be a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of work for me to do the editing and everything else uh, in one day, but we'll see how, how we fare. That's just uh, apologies in advance if the quality isn't as professional as it may be used to us by now. Although if you're used to professional quality from us, you're possibly listening to the wrong podcast. Oh, um, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, slightly different formats to, uh, to the podcast over the next uh, week or so. Let us know if you enjoy that. Let us know if you'd like us to cover more events. Um, until then, uh, please go to www.roaringelephant.org where you can find out more information about the podcast. Send us your questions, especially those around the uh, Hadoop Summit. Uh, please give us a five-star review on iTunes as well. Um, iTunes is one of those areas where uh, many users dis- first discover us, and it helps us to broaden our audience significantly. Um, if you don't think we deserve the full five stars, then that's okay. But uh, in that case, please let us know why via the feedback form on our website, or even drop us an email to podcast at roaringelephant.org with any of your thoughts, criticisms, comments, or any other feedback. My name is Dave. And my name is Jon. And we look forward to talking to you in two weeks' time. In fact, less than that, because we've got the Hadoop Summit specials. See you then. Bye-bye.